Now we're entering a new area of neuroethics. We're not going to look at the neuroscience of ethics. We're going to look at the ethics of neuroscience. That is, the many ethical issues that are raised by recent developments in neuroscience. And the first one we're going to look at is the use of neuroscience to find consciousness in patients who suffered severe brain damage and were diagnosed as being in persistent vegetative states, who showed no sign of consciousness whatsoever on the outside. But Adrian Owen and Steve Lorries and, and a group decided that they would try to look on the inside. So they took a patient who had been brain damaged and showed no signs of consciousness in terms of behavior, anything you could see at the bedside, and they put them into an MRI that looked at the blood flow in their brains to indicate brain activity, and they asked them questions. Now you have to understand, look in the lower left, these patients are not showing any signs of consciousness. So it almost seemed silly to some people, why are you asking them questions? Or giving them directives and telling them what to do. But they tried it and they said, first, imagine that you're playing tennis. You're on the court, you're having a lesson and a professional is hitting a ball that you can hit with your right arm. Uh, you don't have to move your feet because they get it to just the right place. You're just swinging your arm. Imagine that this is happening. And in the patient who showed no signs of consciousness on the outside, they got activity in the supplementary motor area when they were told to imagine playing tennis. And then they said, stop imagining that. Now, imagine that you're walking through your home. This is the spatial navigation uh, directive. Imagine that you're walking through your home, going from one room to another. And there, they got a different group of areas. They got the parahippocampal gyrus, posterior parietal lobe, and the lateral premotor cortex. And so they got those areas, but wait a second, maybe that's you know just the patients, it's just random. No, they ran controls, 12 people, they asked them, in similar circumstances, imagine that you're playing tennis, they still got the same area, the supplementary motor area. They asked these 12 controls, imagine that you're navigating through your home, and they got the same three areas as well. So it looks like the brain activity of these people who are brain damaged and showing no signs of consciousness on the outside uh, are getting activated by these directives in exactly the same way as controls. Not exactly the same, it's a little weaker, but it's the same general areas and the same activations. Now some skeptics said, yeah, maybe it's just a reflex. They hear the word tennis and things happen, but they're not really processing it. But wait a minute, they told them to stop after 30 seconds, and that activity did stop. You say, don't imagine tennis anymore. Well, you just use the word tennis, and yet it stopped. So it looks like they're able to follow the directives. They're able to understand the directives and follow them. But it's just one patient. So a few years later, Monty, and this Steve Lawrence was involved in this as well, so was Adrian Owen, and they had run 54 more patients. Of those patients, 12 had traumatic brain injury, and of those 12, Five showed the ability to modulate their brain activity in response to directives like imagine tennis, imagine navigation. Uh, none of the other patients outside of these 12 with brain damage uh, showed this ability. But within that case, 40% of them were showing signs of consciousness. And then they realized they could ask questions. So they asked patient 23, is your father's name Alexander? If the answer is yes, imagine that you are playing tennis. If the answer is no, imagine that you're navigating through your home. And they saw the activity that was associated with imagining playing tennis, which was the yes answer. And sure enough, his father's name was Alexander. So then they said, is your father's name Thomas? If the answer is yes, imagine tennis. If the answer is no, imagine navigating through your home and they got the no response. So now it looks like this patient is not only conscious, but is able to understand the questions and answer them and remembers who their father was. This patient had been in a persistent vegetative state or had been diagnosed as such for the last five years and had shown no signs of consciousness for five years before they did this. And then they thought, we can ask other questions as well. 
One big question for many people is, well, what do you want us to do about you and your current circumstances? You could ask them in particular whether the patient wants to be kept alive or to be allowed to die. Well, if we detect their consciousness and ask which of these options they want, then there are several possible responses. First, the patient could indicate that they want to die. Second, the patient could indicate that they want not to die. Or third, they could not answer, either by simply giving no response or by giving inconsistent responses on different occasions. So let's imagine first that a patient requests to die. That is to say they refuse treatment. They say, I do not give you my, my permission to treat me because I want to be allowed to die. Just leave me alone. So. We detect consciousness, we ask factual questions like, who's your father? We get correct answers, so they seem to be understanding the questions. Uh, and then we ask them whether they want to die or whether they refuse treatment, and we receive affirmative answers. Yes, yes, tennis. Should we let the patient die? A lot of people say yes because of the autonomy of the patient. But we got to wait a minute and be careful. Before we ask the question, we need to take some earlier steps. We got to ask them, are they in pain? Because if so, you can relieve that pain with anesthesia, and they don't have to die to avoid the pain. We should inform the patient and make sure they understand the information about their diagnosis, their prognosis, their chances of recovery, and so on. We should test for major depression and other types of mental illnesses. Look, you're bound to be depressed if you're in this circumstance, but there's some forms of depression that distort your thinking in ways that make your consent or refusal invalid. And we should seek repeated confirmation, not just today, but try it several days before you do anything in response to make sure that it's a consistent view and reflects what the person really wants. After all of that, it looks like the patient's refusal is valid, at least some patients. And what if they still request to die? That's going to be a tough question. I want to suggest that then it would be morally wrong to treat the patient without permission because they explicitly refused that. And if you did that to someone who was a normal functioning adult, that would be considered wrong. That would be considered assault. You can't treat somebody without their permission uh, unless they're incompetent or uninformed or so on. Now, these PBS patients often don't need ventilation or medication of any particular sort. Maybe some medication to prevent pain, uh, but typically they can stay alive without ventilation or medication. So, the question is whether the prohibition on treatment after a valid refusal of treatment includes forcing food and fluids into a patient who doesn't want them. And again, you got to think if a normal functioning adult says, I don't want you to feed me, I don't want fluids, I refuse to let those, then for the doctor to administer those anyway artificially uh, would be an assault on that person's body without permission. So. If that line of reasoning is right, then the doctors must withdraw food and fluids and let the patient die. The doctor doesn't have a choice. It would be assault if they continued to treat. Now, I know that's a controversial statement, and not everybody agrees with it, but I wanted to put it out there for you to think about. Now let's turn to the second option. Patient requests not to die. We ask them whether they want to. They say, no, 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 you know, navigation, navigation, navigation. We, we should still inform the patient. We should seek repeated confirmation as above, right? But then many people say, after you've got information and repeated confirmation, you should not let them die if they request not to. Okay, that makes sense. That seems right. But then other questions arise. Who's going to pay for this? It's extremely expensive to keep this person alive. And also, how often should they get access to brain scanning? After all, they can't 
communicate with anybody without brain scanning. So you say, yes, we're going to keep you alive, but once a month for 30 minutes, you can communicate a few yes-no questions to your family. Well, that means the rest of the month, outside those 30 minutes, the person is almost tortured. So maybe we ought to give them more. But if we give them more, that's going to greatly increase the expense. So there are going to be difficult questions for society uh, when this type of treatment becomes available to more and more patients. Third option, the patient does not respond. That means either they give no answer or they give different answers on different occasions and you don't know which is the dominant answer. Again, we should try and keep trying because consciousness might be intermittent. They might go to sleep for a while. If we're lucky, the issue can be settled by an advanced directive from the patient. They said what they wanted done in these circumstances or by agreement among friends and family, not agreement about what the fr friends and family want, but instead they know the patient, so they're asked, what do you think the patient would want in these circumstances? And they might agree, but they might disagree, or there might be no one that knows them well enough to say. If we can't get one and two, then the real issue is the burden of proof because we're uncertain. We don't know what the patient would want. And without knowing, we have to decide, what's the worst mistake? Is it worse to keep somebody alive for years after year when they don't want to be alive? If you think of this situation that they're in as some kind of torture, then you're torturing them year after year when they don't want it. But on the other hand, if you let them die when they want to live, you've taken away their life and it almost seems like killing. So this is a very difficult, serious issue that's going to arise more and more as we get more patients uh, who are in these circumstances and who are given this kind of treatment. So that's our first ethical issue that's raised by neuroscience, our first example of the ethics of neuroscience.